Hey there, welcome back to the channel. We're gonna look at how to animate a female walk cycle. Someday in the future, I will upload this to my website and just make a nice written tutorial for you as well. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content in the future. Without further ado, let's get into the video. So I've got this scene right here with this character that I created. It's inspired by a doll. And as you can see, I'm starting to select the layers of the rig I need and which I don't just so I have less things that clutter my screen. I test out the rig, how it's working, a little bit of a deformation test. And let's parent the hair to the head bone for now. I'm not gonna make a hair rig because for this tutorial sake it's not really necessary. You could do it if you want to. And like I said, I parented the hair to the head bone and I'm okay with that for now. So for animating a walk cycle, I suggest that you work your way up from the bottom to the top. Um, and always, in any animation, start with the core. Uh, of course, in a walk cycle, the legs are an essential part of the animation, so you have to pretty much start with the legs. Then work your way up to the core, all the way up to the head. Uh, to accommodate for that, I'm gonna hide everything I don't want to see in the viewport. How I'm gonna do that is quite simple. So I hide everything I don't want to see, for example, the hair. Uh, I go in edit mode for the body and create a new vertex group, call it arms. Uh, you can easily select your mesh if you have seams, and in this case I do, otherwise you need to make a selection by hand or any other method you prefer. I select an island selection in the polygon mode and I can select the islands of the arms. I assign this to the vertex group and I make a new vertex group called head. Repeat the same thing for the head, assign, and as you can see right here, I just weight painted the head and the arms. And with that, we move over to the modifier stack. In the modifier stack, I wanna grab a mask modifier. Um, this mask modifier, we're gonna add the vertex group, the arms, and invert that vertex group so we don't see the arms. So let's add another mask modifier. There it is. Do the same thing, but then choose head again, invert the vertex group, select every piece that is still visible that you don't want to see. For now, I just hide it with H. And we're pretty much good to go. For a walk cycle, it is crucial to determine the length of your animation. In this case, I chose 33 frames. So the 32nd frame is going to be the end frame and it loops back to frame number one, which is also frame number 33. The last thing I want to do for visibility's sake uh, because I don't want you guys looking at this gray character all the time. I'm going to select a matcap in the viewport display settings right at the top here. For the first pose, also known as the contact pose, in this case it's the contact pose, we're going to create our keyframe set. So the leg controllers and the two hip controllers, um, which are basically the same. One I'm going to use for the location and the other one I'm going to use for the rotation of the hips. I space out the feet front to back. A good rule of thumb is the feet are usually two and a half feet apart from each other, which in this case is a bit mad because the shoes are a bit exaggerated. So I brought it back slightly. So it's in this case, maybe one and a half. And I lower the hip controller so that the, so that the legs are a bit more bended instead of so overstretched. So I keyframe the location of both the hip controller and the feet. With everything keyframed, we see that the back leg is a bit more stretched. And to accommodate for that, I'm gonna use the heel roll controller and keyframe that as well. And for this contact pose, we need to lift up the feet as well, like this. Don't forget to set your keyframes for these properties as well. With one contact pose in place, we can copy it right here in the dope sheet editor to the last frame. So that's gonna be, in my case, frame number 33. Right in the middle, that is frame number 17. We want to create our flipped contact pose. So with every controller we have visible selected, I'm gonna say Control C, or you can right mouse click and say copy pose. Again, with everything selected, right click and say paste X flipped pose. And as you can see, it just flipped the pose around. Just a heads up, you have to keyframe it still. Remember to say I, that's what I do, keyframe all available channels. Uh, now we have our three extreme poses. It's time to move on. So firstly, we have the down pose, the passing point, and the up pose. And after the first step, things are repeated, only flipped, of course. 
So at this stage, you only have to focus on the up and down motion of your hip. Besides that, it's quite handy to notice that the feet are placed in front of each other. Females tend to place their feet a bit more in front of each other. You can rotate the feet outwards to get a more ballet kind of sense. The character should always be balanced, so keep in mind your center of gravity for your character. It should always be supported by the leg you are standing on. As you saw in the example, I took all the keyframes and made it a stepped cycle. As you can see right now, it's in Bezier curves. Select all the curves, press T, constant. You can do this in the dope sheet or in the graph editor. Now that they are set to constant, you can see how they changed. So all the way up from frame one to four, pose will hold. And at frame five, it will switch to the down pose. Like I said, we're gonna build this animation up in stages. It's nice because we can really focus on specific parts of the body. And hopefully you'll get a grasp of what parts go into a walk cycle more than if I do all the things at once, right? With that said, we're gonna focus on the hips. I have the hip controller right here that I rotate, and a key thing to notice is rotate your hip controller towards the leading leg, the leading, uh, towards the leading feet. Rotate the hip upwards, in this case on the y-axis, away from the leading step. You can use the same trick, copy and pasting, and copy and paste in reverse for the keyframes on 33 and 17. I'm gonna roughly create the in-betweens for this and I'm gonna fine tune these in the graph editor later. So right here in the graph editor, I am going to adjust my curve. What I'm looking for is a slow build up from one to five and then a slightly higher jump to nine, which is the passing point. Uh, and I'm just gonna ease out after that. We saw how we adjusted for the steps on the rotation of the hips. Now we have to accommodate for the center of gravity. At the point where you're standing on one foot, your hips should move, translate over to the side you're standing on. Uh, this is because you have to be in balance, of course. Otherwise, you would fall over to the right side or left side, depending whatever leg you're standing on, of course. As for the rotation of the hip, like I said, I'm gonna tweak the in-betweens in the graph editor. I just roughly painted them in. And in your mind, you can maybe visualize a trend line between these steps going up and down, creating an easing for the apex of our animation. And we're gonna flip it, of course, with the same trick. We use control and uh, mirror pasting on the other side. And just to resume, these are the poses that we created. I want you to notice that, of course, the hips move over, like I said before, from left to right. In this case, it's the x-axis. The biggest motion from left to right is between the down pose and the passing pose. After that, it eases out a little bit and you can maybe overshoot or cushion it and make it an ease out of the passing point, which actually means that the passing point would be the apex of the X movement of the hips. That's all depending on what flare you want to give your animation. The rotation on the Z axis, I believe, is rotating towards the leading leg and rotate the hip up on the leg you're standing on. Like we said, we're gonna move up through the body and start animating the chest right now. Um, so this chest controller, I set a keyframe for the rotation and for the location. I also included one chest controller lower in the spine, uh, just to get a bit more fluid and a feel that they are connected, but still maintain a certain level of looseness in the character. You see me switch quite a lot between the dope sheet and the graph editor, that's because you just should use whatever you feel comfortable with. In the meantime, I've been creating a similar arc as we did for the hips. The rotation, only thing I did is I flipped it. So where the rotation of the z-axis of the hip is moving toward the leading leg, the chest is moving in an opposite direction. Good to note is that in the graph editor, as well as in the dope sheet editor, you can isolate a channel, whichever property you're animating by using Shift H with that certain channel selected. So keep that in mind for the rest of the tutorial. Since you are walking and you have an up and down motion from your legs and your hip, naturally this will create a rhythm in the body, right? Up and down, seeing that every part of your body is connected, but also there is a part that is leading and there are parts that are following, creating overlap and drag. These are animation terms you will hear quite a lot. So will the chest follow the hip movement only with a different timing. Uh, on frame seven, the chest will go a bit down, following the hip movement only with an offset. Then it will jump up at frame 13, overlapping the hip movement, coming all the way down at frame number 17. After frame number 17, rinse and repeat only flipped as usual for the rest of the poses. At this stage, you can really start to tell if something is wrong with your animation. 
So for example, if the chest feels a bit too loose from your body, bring back the overshoot and vice versa, right? If, if it feels a bit more rigid, you can try and experiment with delaying the overshoot a bit more. This comes down to practice and experiments in and just moving your keyframes around. In the meantime, if you like this video, please subscribe to the channel because there's more coming and everything you do and helps me make better content. At this point, the core of our animation is done. So what I like to do is switch over from constant to Bezier. So right away I see a curve that I think is a bit wonky and I like to fix it. I select this curve and I press Shift H to isolate this curve in the graph editor. And with it selected, we can see on the left hand side that this is called the torso controller. And in this case, I'm gonna switch the up pose up to be the apex of the animation. Uh, the passing point and the contact pose are gonna be cushions or easing out and easing ins of the apex just by moving around some of the points in the grab editor. Using grabbing, scaling, and rotating of the points, you can get a nice and clean curve. Uh, and of course, at the end of everything, you can go back in and start to polish them. Another thing I like to note for a cycle is that it's quite important that the endings are usually not eased out because they continue on the other side of the cycle again, right? So you want the ending of the curve to be a continuous line into the beginning of the curve again, if that makes sense. It is good to note that sometimes it's okay to delete a keyframe uh, because in some cases it just interrupts the flow of your curve, uh, which means in some cases it doesn't help because it messes up your timing or your curve. As you can see right here, in the feed you can see that there is a weird dip in the curve that creates an odd kind of spacing, if you ask me. Usually though, for the feed, the moment your feet make contact to the ground, we like to switch to a linear interpolation. So you can do that again, press T and say linear instead of Bezier. And like I said before, it's okay to delete some of the points on this curve because the first would give us quite an odd spacing, which in the end result could lead to sliding of the feet when they move over the surface of the ground, right? Uh, do the same thing for the other side as well. And this is not gonna be one-on-one -on -one with the other curve because it's flipped and also the curve is shifted, probably 17 frames which means uh, you just have to go in manually and see where it makes contact with the floor and where it stops making contact with the floor and make those keyframes linear. Sometimes you get nasty knee pops or whatever weird artifacts you can get in animation. And what I like to do, if your rig has this ability to use the tweak controller and then enable the motion path in the armature tab right here, which will show up in the viewport. And there we can see that at the start and the ending, there is a bit of confusion where the knee should be. And also halfway through, there is some jittering of the knee. So I'm gonna go back in and manually set keyframes, even frame by frame for where I think the knee should be. First, I'm gonna do this roughly, and then I'm gonna do a, if you wanna call it a second pass, uh, to figure out what the spacing of these keyframes should be, which means that the frame number two is closer to one than three is to two. And you can do this throughout everything of your body, right? Uh, track the motion trail and see if you got a nice arc. For this animation, I'm not gonna go all the way polished because it's for a tutorial's sake. Um, but of course we want to look somewhat decent. Usually I start with the feet because they make contact sooner with the floor than you think. Right now it's going from frame one to frame five to actually hit the ground. And that's not realistic. I want it to be somewhere around frame three, so maybe even two, but that's quite snappy if you ask me. It is time to animate some floppy toes. What I want to do is I want to keyframe the outer contact poses and then move to somewhere on the timeline. In this case, I'm going to move to frame eight or nine. And at that point, I want to drag. So that means rotate back the toes and keyframe that moving on in the timeline and frame 17, I will do the reverse, delaying the rotation of the toes. And somewhere around 20, I will snap the toes back to the ground. I think we should now have a decent looking animation for our core and also the legs because like I said before, the legs are a critical part of a walk cycle. Let's now continue with the arms. Uh, what I want to see is I want to check the roll of the bones, which means which way are they orientated and what access will cause the most gimbal log. Usually this rig is set to Quartonian, which you can use obviously but it's easier, at least that's what I think, to use an XYZ Euler uh, because that's easier to clean up in the graph editor. Meanwhile, I started to sculpt in a contact pose for the arm, which is actually opposing the movement of the legs. 
Let's move on to frame number 17, which is the end of the first step. And we're gonna move the shoulder a bit forward, rotate it a bit more in with the body, and just make everything swing forward. And lastly, I'm gonna copy the first frame to the last frame. Yeah, normally you would just do the same thing on the other side as well, but then, of course, flipping the motion. We're not gonna do that today, we've seen that before, you know how to flip the animation. What you saw at the beginning here was me checking what the name was of the hip bone, which I need because I want to parent the controller to the hip. Firstly though, I need to switch from FK to IK. The end of this IK chain is the hand of course, and we want to select that controller, move into the bone constraints tab, and use a child of, I want to make it a child of, of the hip bone, which we just found out the name for. Moving the fingers to wrap around the hip and use the IK swivel controller to animate the elbow. This might be a bit aggressive, so I have to go back in and polish it, but you get the gist, right? And what I also like to do is move up and rotate the shoulder a bit when we are beyond the up pose, so we create an overlap in the shoulder movement, which serves for the animation to feel a bit more loose. You don't have to follow this tutorial one on one, just apply the principles I showed you. For the arm, like I said, we have to polish some things, so I go back in and select the, the forearm and the upper arm and I make some motion trails for them, which you can do in the armature tab and select in uh, motion path or whatever it's called as, as a calculate for the time you want to calculate, of course. And then go back in and fine tune the curve, either in the dope sheet editor and in your 3D viewport or the graph editor, whatever you prefer. It's not perfect, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm happy with it. So I'm gonna continue on with the hand. This process is basically the same as the things we did for the toe. Um, looking for the moments where you should have overlap or drag and keyframing that into the fingers and the hand. So the wrist uh, and the fingers, like I said, and giving these their own timing. So yeah, that is just me playing around with the hand, making sure we don't cut through the mesh of the leg uh, because that would be quite weird, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. For, uh, for me as well, this was quite a part of experimenting, seeing what looks nice, making some previews, previewing my PNG sequence into After Effects, seeing, ah, oh, I don't like this bit, I don't like that bit, try, try out some different stuff. Like I said, experiment with your animation as well. You don't have to follow this exactly, right? And now onto the last bit of this animation is we bring back the head and everything that is attached to it. So the hair, the eyes, and everything else. So what I sometimes like to do if I can't figure out how to get the right overlap is I copy one-on-one -on -one the up and down motion of the chest for example. I grab all the keyframes and I move them two frames, five frames, whatever frames you like to try out. Since this is a cycle I'll go to the last frame, keyframe available, I grab this keyframe, move back to the first frame and place them right there. If you want to see how you can export a Marvelous Designer animation to Blender, let me know in the comments down below and I will create a video on that as well. And that wraps up this video. If you liked it, please leave a like down below, comment if you have any questions, and as always, stay creative. I'll see you next time. Ciao.